The Hound of the Baskervilles by A. Colin Doyle Chapter 1 Mr. Sherlock Holmes Mr. Sherlock Holmes, who was usually very late in the mornings, save upon those not infrequent occasions, when he was up all night, was seated at a breakfast table. I stood upon the heath rug and picked up the stick which our visitor had left behind him. The night before, it was a fine, thick piece of wood, bulbous headed the sort which is known as a Ping Yang Lawyer. Just under the head was a broad silver brand, nearly an inch across, to James Morarty, M-R-C-S, for his friends of the C-C-H was engraved upon it, the date 1884. It was just a stick, as the old-fashioned family practitioner used to carry, dignified, solid, and reassuring. It was just such a stick as the old-fashioned family practitioner used to carry, dignified, solid, and reassuring. Well, Watson, what do you f- make of it? Holmes was sitting with his back to me. I had given him no sign of my occupation. How did you know what I was doing? I believe you have eyes in the back of your head. I have at least a well-polished silver-plated coffee pot in front of me, said he. But tell me, Watson, what do you make of our visitor's stick? Since he's been, we have been so unfortunate as to miss him, have no notion of his errand. This accidental souvenir becomes of importance. Let me hear you reconstruct the man by an examination of it. I think, I think, I said, I follow, following as far as I could, could the methods of my companion, and Dr. Marjorie is a successful elderly medical man, well esteemed since those who know him gave him his mark of their appreciation. Good, said Holmes. Excellent. I think also the probability is in favour of his being a country practitioner who does a great deal of his visiting on foot. Why so? Because his stick though originally a very handsome one, had been so knocked about that I can hardly imagine a town practitioner carrying a stick, carrying it, a thick iron frodural is worn down. So it's evident he has done a great amount of walking with it. Perfectly sound, said Holmes. And then again, there is his friends of the CCH, I should guess, that to be something hunt, the local hunt, whose members he was possibly given some surgical assistance, which has made him of small, uh, which was made him of small presentation in return. Really, Watson, you ex- you'll excel yourself," said Holmes, pushing back his chair and lighting a cigarette. "I am bound to say that, in all accounts which you have been so good as to give my." own small achievements, you have heavily underrated your own abilities. It may be that you are not yourself luminous. You have, uh, you are a conductor of light. Some people without possessing genius, a remarkable power of stimulating it. I confess, my dear fellow, I am very much in your debt. He never said as much before. I must admit that his words gave me keen pleasure. For I had been piqued by his indifference, by my admiration and attempts which are made to give publicly to his methods. I was proud, too, to think that I had so far mastered his system as to apply it in a way which earned his approval. He now took the stick from my hands and examined it for a few minutes with his own naked eyes. Then, with an expression of interest, he laid down his cigarette, and carrying the cane to the window, he looked over it again with a cortex lens. Interesting, though elementary, he returned to his favourite corner of the settee, 
It is certainly one of two incantations upon the stick. It gives the basis for several deductions. Has, has anything escaped me? I asked with some importance of importance. I trust that it is nothing of concurrence which I have over, I have overlooked. I'm afraid, my dear Watson, that most of your conclusions were irregularous. Which I said when you stimulated me, I meant to be frank that it's noting your facilities. I was occasionally guided towards the truth. Not that you're entirely wrong in this instance. The man is certainly a country practitioner. He walks a great deal. Then I was right to that extent. But that was all. Oh no, my dear Watson. Not at all. May it know in no means at all. I suggest, for example, that a presentation of a doctor is more likely to come from a hospital than a hunt, and the initials CC are placed before the hospital. The words cherry and cress very naturally suggest themselves. You may be right. The probability lies in that direction, and if we take this as a working hypothesis, we have a fresh basis on which to start our construction of this unknown visitor. Well then, supporting that CCCH does stand for Charing Cross Hospital, what further inferences may we draw? Do none suggest themselves? You know my methods apply them. I think of the obvious conclusion that a man was practised in town before going to the country. I think we must might venture a little further than this. Look at look at it in this light. On the occasion will it be the most probable that such a presentation would be made. When would his friends unite to g give him a pledge of their goodwill? Obviously, at a moment when Dr. Mortimer drew his service from the hospital in order to start a practice for himself. We know there has been a presentation. We believe this has been, been a charge. There has been a change from a hospital, town hospital to a country practice. It is then stretching our, interfer our interference, interference too far, say the presentation was on the occasion of the change. It certainly seems possible. Now you observe, it could not have been on the star for the hospital, since only a man well established in London practice could hold such a position, and such a one would not drift into the country. What was he then? What was he then? If he's in the hospital, yet on the staff, he could have only been a house surgeon or house physician. Little more than a junior student. He left five years ago. The date is on the stick. So your grave middle aged family practitioner vanishes into thin air, my dear Watson. The emotions a young fellow under thirty, admirable and ambitious, absent minded and possessor of a favourite dog, which I shall describe roughly being larger than a terrier and smaller than a mastiff. I laughed incredulously, and Sherlock Holmes leaned back and said he blew his little wavering rings of smoke up to the ceiling. As to the latter part, I have no means of checking you said I, but at least it's not difficult to find a few particulars about a man's age and professional career. From my small medical shelf, I took down the medical directory and turned up the name of several Mortimers, but only one that could be our visitor. I read his record around. Mortimer James M. Dot R. Dot C. Dot S. 1982, Gripton, Dartmoor, Devon House, surgeon from 1882 to 1884, a Charing Cross Hospital, winner of the Jackson Prize, comparative pathology, the essay entitled His Deeds is a Reversation, corresponding member of the Swedish Pathological Society, all for the same freaks and alterations, Lancet, 1882, Dewey Progress, Journal for Psychology, March in 1883, medical officer for the parishes of Ripton, Fallsbury and High Barrow. No mention of the local hunt, Watson, said Holmes with a mischievous smile, but country doctor, as you very certainly is deserved. I think I'm fairly justified in my appearances. 
inf- interferences. As for the objectives, I said, I rem- if I remember right, admirable, ambitious, and absent-minded is my experience. Not only an admirable man in this world who receives testimonials, only an ambitious one who abandons a London career for the country. Only an, and only an absent minded one who leaves his stick and knocks his visiting card on wanting an hour in, my, in your room. And the dog has been in the habit of carrying this, he has been carrying, been in the habit of carrying his stick behind his master. Being a heavy stick, the dog held it tightly in the middle and marks his teeth are very plainly visible. The dog's jaw as shown in space between these marks. It's too broad, in my opinion, for terror not built enough, but enough for a mastiff. I must, may have been, yes, by Jove, it's the curly herd spaniel, herd spaniel. He risen and paced the room as he spoke. Now he haunted the recess of the window. As such, there was such a ring of conviction in his voice that glanced up in surprise. My dear fellow, how can you be possibly sure of that? For the very simple reason, I see the dog myself. I see the dog myself on our very door step, and there's a ring of its owner. Don't want to move, I beg you, Watson. He's a professional bother, brother of yours, and your persistence may be assistance to me. Now, in this dramatic moment of fate, Watson, then, when you heard a step upon a stair which is walking into your life, you would know not either for good or ill. What does Dr. James Mortimer, the man of science, ask of Judge Holmes, specialist in crime, come in? Appearance of a visitor was a surprise to me, since I expected a typical country practitioner. He's a very tall, thin man with long nose, like a beak, which jutted out between two keen grey eyes, set closely together and sparking lead brilliantly from behind a pair of gold rimmed glasses. Clad in professional, he was clad in professional, but rather solely fashioned. For his flock coat was dingy, his trousers frayed. Though young, his long back, his long black, and was already bowed. He walked with a forward thrust of his head and general air of peering benevolence. As he entered his, uh, entered his eyes fell upon the stick in Holmes' hand. He ran towards it with an exclamation of joy. I'm so very glad, said he. I was not sure whether I left it here or the shopping office or not lose that stick for the world. Presentation, I see, said Holmes. Yes, sir. From Charing Cross Hospital. For one of two friends, the on occasion of my marriage. Dear, dear, that's bad, said Holmes, shaking his head. Dr. Mortimer blinked through his glasses in mild astonishment. Why was it bad? Only that you would, only that you have disarranged your, our little deductions. You married, you say? Yes, sir, I married, and so left the hospital. With all the helps of consu- consulting practice is necessary to make a home of my own. Come, come, we're not so far wrong after all, said Holmes. And now, Dr. James Mortimer, Mr. Sir, Mr. Humble, M. R. C. S. A man of precise mind, is it very evidently? A dabble in science, Mr. Holmes. A picker up of shells of the shores. A great unknown ocean. I assume that it is Mr. Do- Sherlock Holmes, whom I am addressing, and not. No, this is my dear friend, Dr. Watson. Glad to meet you, sir. I've heard your name mentioned in connection with that of your friend. You interest me very much, Mr. Holmes. I've hardly expected so dulloclop sepletic. A skull of such well marked superable blue bitable development. Would you have any objection to my running my finger along your partial virtue, virtue? Cast your skull, sir, until the original is available, would be an ornament of to any own pathological museum. It is not it is not my intention to force them, but I confess I covert covet your skull. Sherlock Holmes waved our strange visitor into a chair. You are an enthusiast of your, in your line of thought. Perceive, sir, as I am mine, said he. I observe from the, your forefinger. You make your own cigarettes. Have you no hesitation in lighting one? 
A man drew up paper and tobacco and twirled one up into the other with surprising dexterity. He had long, quivering fingers as agile and restless as an antennae of an insect. Holmes was silent. His little darling, darting glances showed me the interest which he took in our own, in our curious companion. I presume, sir, said he, alas, that is not merely for the purpose of examining my skull. You have done the, me the honour to call here last night and again today. No, sir, no. Though I am happy, I have had the opportunity of doing that as well. I come up to you, Mr. Come to you. Mr. Holmes, because I recognise that I am myself an unpractical man, because I am suddenly confronted with a most serious, extraordinary problem, recognising as I do, you are the second highest expert in Europe. Indeed, sir, may I inquire who is an honour to be first? Asked Holmes with some asperity. To the man of precise, precisely scientific mind, the well, Monsieur Betteron, must always appeal strongly. Then you, then you bet you not better consult him, a friend. I said, sir, to precisely says in mind, but of a practical man of affairs is the knowledge that you stand alone. I trust, sir, I have not invariably just a little said, her, sir, said Holmes. I think, Doctor Mortimer, you would do wisely if, without more ado, you would kindly tell me the plainly. What in exact nature the problem is in which you demand my assistance?